how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on the philosophy of accelerationism by now beginning a discussion of James Ellis's book, Exiting Modernity. This is a collection of essays from his blog, which I would highly recommend you to please go out and just buy a copy of the book right away. Um, I provide the link in the video description. Now, I've been having a lot of fun reading all the essays in it lately, but I'm actually going to do my first video on the book over an essay which is found near the end of it. This is in the section on accelerationism because this is where Ellis provides one of the best explanations of what that word actually means. In particular, in the essay titled Accelerationism, Capitalism as Critique, Ellis clarifies the meaning of this term through explicitly seeking to correct or refute the popular media caricature that accelerationism is quote-unquote, just a political movement. Instead, Ellis fleshes out in great detail why accelerationism is a philosophy in the proper sense of the term, and particularly a transcendental philosophy informed by the most rigorous readings of Deleuze and Kant. As Ellis would explain near the very end of this essay, the idea that accelerationism is just a political stance is actually founded upon what he calls a categorical transcendental error. That is to say, it relies upon an inherent contradiction of its own terms. To try to put this very briefly, even though that's not really possible, uh, treating accelerationism as something political rather than philosophical is a categorical transcendental error because ultimately it confuses the Kantian outside with the Kantian inside, which is another way of saying it confuses maybe the thing in itself with the subject's representation, or if we put this in Deleuzian terms, it confuses the pure differential virtuality of the outside with some particular actualized or identifiable structure counted among the human subject's syntheses of experienced contents on the inside. Or perhaps we could just say that mere politics deals with just another element of the conditioned reality, whereas acceleration has to do with the nominal conditions as such. Now, of course, the first time you hear any of these ways of phrasing the idea, it'll sound like more than a mouthful. So in this video, we're going to try to unpack what all of that actually means. But I'd like to first begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there, too, for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Link to both my Patreon and Subscribestar accounts are in the video description. Now, as we get into the text itself, um, we also begin with another quote from near the very end of the essay in which Ellis clarifies that the well-known imperative to quote-unquote accelerate the process actually amounts to what he calls a semantic mistake because if you phrase it that way, this will mislead the reader to think that acceleration just has to do with merely human forms of agency. In this sense, if one chooses to accelerate the process by, say, joining in the sort of uh, boogeyman pranks which the media alleges exist somewhere, um, this would actually just be another form of consumerism in disguise, um, allowing people to choose the market niche of getting to be accelerationists would therefore cause acceleration to be cleanly incorporated back into the same capitalist system which it was supposed to challenge, which would in turn prove that it's not really a serious philosophical movement. But because acceleration is a transcendental process of the outside, it does not owe its existence to anything on the inside, such as a consumerist choice on the part of we mere humans. For as Ellis clarifies himself near the beginning of the essay, the kind of entity which we mere humans are is of interest to the accelerationist, but not because we humans are the origin of the process, but instead because humans simply provide the smallest analyzable unit for the kind of thing which really interests us, which is the notion of a desiring machine in general. But in addition to being the smallest analyzable unit of the Deleuze-Guattarian 
desiring machine, man's role as the Kantian subject or something like it also provides a very useful reference point to discuss the relation between inside and outside, especially with regard to that mysterious thing called time. Because the nature of human experience is that it always deals with both. The inside and outside are, of course, better known in philosophical circles through their Kantian aliases, aliases which are the phenomenal and the nominal. Ellis is careful to clarify that the kind of desire which we refer to when talking about Deleuze Guattari and desiring machines must not be understood in the usual Freudian sense of a desire which desires some definite exterior object simply because it lacks it. For such a teleologically oriented desire could theoretically be satisfied simply through having that object be obtained. This promise of a completion though, really is just the logic of consumerism in disguise, which is, of course, proven to be empirically false through the simple mundane fact that we modern consumers constantly obtain the objects which uh, corporate marketers trick us into thinking we want, but we remain even more unsatisfied after we obtain them. Another problem with this Freudian model is that it portrays desire as something which would be limited to the inside or the human subject's private stream of representations through strictly opposing the lack which I have on the inside with the craved object which must exist out there on the outside. But for Deleuze and Quadri, in contrast, desire is not limited to the human subject's inside because a desire simply is that nominal or real force on the outside which continuously produces that thing which we call reality with no need to ever presuppose a Freudian notion of lack or even any human subject at all. This deluso guattarian inversion leads us to have to revise the psychoanalytic model, which claims that man consciously chooses to desire and only ever in accord with his own privately accessible will. Ellis cites Leotard as one source which shows why this is wrong through revealing that all of desire's intensity must come from precisely outside the subject, because that is where the thing which Deleuze calls the virtual is to be found. Now, Deleuze's interpretation of the terms virtual and actual are, of course, a huge topic which we don't exactly have time to flesh out in detail here, but for the moment I'll just have you recall that one way to understand this is that Deleuze emphasized Nietzschean becoming over the older Aristotelian idea of being in the sense of something like substance in his um, classic work, Difference and Repetition. This reversal which Deleuze performed allowed him to show that what really matters in something like uh, Becoming Jealous is not that some Aristotelian substance is given as an object and then secondarily fit under the categorical headings of, say, quality, quantity, location, etc. No, what really matters in Becoming Jealous is the way that, say, my jealous thoughts or jealous acts can have meaning and can have a power, but only because they establish a properly ecological connection to, say, the quasi-platonic idea of jealousy, which, give the, which gives the act meaning, as well as the raw intensities which give those acts power. Because such ideas and intensities are virtual rather than actual, that is to say ideas and intensities are not anything like the kinds of objects which could be submitted to an Aristotelian categorical analysis, we find that insofar as the actual might exist, this is only because it is secondarily derived from the virtual which always exceeds it asymmetrically. Or to frame this in quasi-Kantian terms, the inside can be populated by experiences of actual identifiable objects which do lend themselves once again to something like the Aristotelian analysis of substance and the other categories. But that can be the case only if these are all founded on the more originary ideas and intensities located on the outside in the virtual realm 
for which the latter do not lend themselves so easily to any Aristotelian categorical analysis. This virtual outside, which lies beyond the criteria of the actual and identifiable, must also therefore lie beyond the synthesis of my own representations on the inside. This duality between virtual and actual, or as we might say between outside and inside, also allows us to see why exactly it is that Freud was wrong about desire. Because the edible structure which forces all desire to be interpreted in terms of the predictable triad of the mother, the father, and the child, is always really limited to the inside. That is to say, it's really limited to the subjective syntheses of some psychologically troubled person. It cannot, therefore, account for that much broader phenomenon, which is a desire as such in the deluso guatarian sense of the term. This is because the latter desire as such, always asymmetrically exceeds the former, that is to say, the edible interpretation in terms of the triad mother, father, and me, in much the same way that the virtual always asymmetrically exceeds the actual, and the outside always asymmetrically exceeds the insight. Insofar as we humans can undergo experiences of desire, what this really means is that my becoming a desiring subject at that moment is something which establishes a properly ecological connection to, once again, the virtual ideas and intensities which definitively lie on the outside. But if my own desire always paradoxically deals with the outside, despite seeming to be the most intimately personal feature of my own inside, this begs the question of how such a relation can work out in temporal terms. But to answer that, we have to revisit Deleuze's three syntheses of time as presented in his classic work, Difference and Repetition, as Ellis himself does in this essay. Ellis describes Deleuze's first synthesis of time as a passive synthesis, which continually constructs the passing present which we mundanely experience all the time. It constructs this passing present through actually using things which are not themselves present. And it does this by folding an anticipation of the future into a retention of the just recently past past. Ellis is very careful to note, however, that because Deleuze understood this to be a passive synthesis with no need for the classic Cartesian subject, this construction of the present moment is not something which has to be actively performed by man himself. Nonetheless, this model reveals the present to be something that only exists on the outside, and only because the present itself is a secondary side effect or product of some more originary procedures. In other words, even the present itself does not really exist as any objectively present, uh, no pun intended, object. This strange inversion that reveals the present itself to not really be present leads Ellis to say, quote unquote, man within the first synthesis is processed by time. So too, if desire ever is on the inside, this is only because it was processed by the outside through similarly passive and non-Cartesian syntheses. The mystery of how the virtual and actual can communicate with one another from the outside to the inside cannot, however, be answered with the resources of the first synthesis alone. Instead, we are led to consider Deleuze's second synthesis in time because this is the one which deals with the virtual through giving us the temporal synthesis of memory. Now, the funny thing about memory's relation to the virtual is that if you really think about it, memory in the proper sense of the term, rather than just the passing retention, which um, you had in the first synthesis, um, allows you to cast your memory back to, on the one hand, particular identifiable objects like, say, a coconut, but on the other hand, what you are really directing your memory to are the virtual ideas of, say, the hardness or the hairiness which that coconut expressed. And this is something which can be related to as virtual ideas at that moment 
even in the absence of any actual or identifiable object like a coconut which once expressed them. For this reason, the kind of past which you deal with in the second synthesis is no longer that of the recently past retention used to construct a passing present moment, which is what the first synthesis was limited to, but is instead that of a pure past. Perhaps surprisingly, this second synthesis also alters the present into one that does not simply pass in a continuous and automatic manner from one moment to another, but can instead be intentionally aimed at some specific location in the past, such as a particular memory through which the hardness and hairiness of some coconut would be exceptionally vividly recalled. One's desire of that remembered coconut is therefore inherently virtual because the thing desired is the abstract coconutness which does not belong to any actual or identifiable object, but instead aims into the realm of the virtual itself. This realm of the virtual itself is, of course, otherwise known as the outside. Likewise, we actually get it wrong if we think of desiring machines, or rather machines in general, in terms of the actual machines which we are familiar with through the historically anomalous condition of being surrounded by modern technologies in recent years. Rather than get distracted by the latest round of aggressively marketed industrial gadgets, we must instead try to understand what Ellis calls quote-unquote virtual machinizing or the kind of generalized connecting and producing which always goes on in the background to impersonally construct reality as we know it. In fact, insofar as reality ever is given for us, it is given simply because such realness had to have itself been produced by the production slash connection of the virtual machinizing of so many impersonal procedures which vastly exceed the narrow frame of reference provided by our own subjective inside. Ellis qualifies this classical deluso guatachian thesis, however, by arguing that the desiring machine portrayed in Anti-Oedipus is itself deceptively Kantian in its nature because the connection which it establishes between the inside and the outside or between the actual and the virtual, is such that the alteration of man's nature, wherein he becomes machinic through desiring production, immanentizes him into the transcendental circuitry of production itself as a part of it, end quote. This will paradoxically culminate, Ellis tells us, into a grand representational machine defined on the inside as time, which in reality is the rep representation of time in time. Now, of course, there's a lot to think about in these quotes from Alice, but one thing that strikes me as particularly important is the realization that insofar as we humans can privately represent the flow of time on the subjective inside, which we have, this is only because the noumenal time on the outside has possessed us as some alien power, which, as Ellis tells us, leads man to believe and construct a reality wherein he is on time as opposed to in time. Now, if you really think about that quote, there's something inherently artificial about the idea of having to be quote-unquote on time, in the sense that the ticking of the clock, which regulates one's motions to conform to strict deadlines regarding where one has to be, or what one has to be doing throughout the day, these do not emerge in a totally spontaneous manner from our own subjective insight, but instead always seem to mysteriously invade us from the outside, and specifically from the outside's machinic processes of connecting and producing. So too with desire, we find another instance of machinic processes affecting us through having the outside enter the inside. Man, as just the smallest analyzable unit of the desiring machine, only can desire, then, through having his own desires be defined as the outside entering the inside. The post-humanist implications of the theory should therefore be quite clear, 
man's own essence is revealed to be subsumed into the same outside force that invaded him as an alien power, even in what was supposed to be his most spontaneous and personal acts of desiring. An invasion of the outside into the inside, which is actually structurally isomorphic to the way that capital itself functions. In light of this shocking reversal, one cannot help but ask whether there could be any hope for an escape from the game, to which Ellis replies that the only exit uh, is called schizophrenia. In particular, the schizo explodes the structurations of the Oedipal Triangle by revealing them to be secondarily actual, or merely transcendent structures, which are fundamentally at odds with the intensive desiring production which you find in the virtual plane of imminence which defines the outside as such. Or perhaps it would be closer to the truth to say that what the schizo shows us are just so many new ways of appropriating the virtual into the actual, in that Ellis himself describes the schizo as the one who quote-unquote seeks out limits, decodes stagnant desires, and processes and reappropriates their virtuality back into the inside as something new. Schizophrenia does this by taking a line of flight, an operation which transcends the actual and ascends to the virtual. This schizophrenic line of flight therefore provides the answer to the central mystery of accelerationism, how one can establish a connection to the new as, in a certain sense, an alias for the pure virtuality which the outside itself really is. But if we're going to be talking about the outside, we have to first clarify what Deleuze and Guattari meant when they talked about the body without organs, or the BWO as Ellis himself calls it. Now, Ellis describes the BWO as, quote-unquote, the theoretical construction of the production in itself of the outside. He calls this a void of atemporal virtualization, not in relation to the pure past of the inside, but as a transcendental function of production and communication. This body without organs is where the possible futures can be found, because at that point, these are still free-flowing potentialities which have not yet been actualized into the socius, as Deleuze and Guattari would call it in anti -Oedipus. This fine distinction between the body without organs and the socius explains the properly Nicklandian mystery regarding how it could be possible for us to do things before they make sense. The answer we now find is that something new can invade from the outside in all of its radical novelty before it comes to make sense according to some intellectual process on the inside. And it can do this because the body without organs always asymmetrically exceeds the socius in just the same way that the virtual always exceeds asymmetrically the actual. Or as Ellis says himself, quote unquote, to do things before they make sense is to be possessed by the outside in the form of an auto-constructive virtuality. Under capitalism, we get a uniquely special case of this body without organs, because the way that capitalism operates is that it must be defined by constant change. While this need for constant change within capitalism might be obvious simply through empirical observation, the deeper philosophical reasons why this happens require some unpacking. Ellis theorizes that capitalism cannot ever allow anything to reach what might be called a completed state, but instead prefers to constantly force whatever is inside back onto the outside yet again in order to produce a still greater productive output from it due to the positive feedback loop which might naively be called progress. It is this and this alone that explains capitalism's uncanny ability to be universally compatible with quite literally any ideology, even including those ideologies which are explicitly meant to challenge it, such as Marxism, environmentalism, or the SJW movement. It is precisely because ideology concerns the inside that it is so easily incorporated back into capital's positive feedback loops, because capital's only real interest is to turn whatever is inside 
back into the outside in order to generate more productivity from it yet again. If you've ever wondered why Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion, and every other mainstream liberal environmentalist group is so easily reincorporated back into the same capitalist system which they were explicitly supposed to be rebelling against, well, now you will realize that it is precisely because these groups only ever consider ideology as a phenomenon of the conditionally synthesized insight, without realizing how capital's indifference to that insight is exactly what allows it to universally transform anything whatsoever back into more outside level production. On a transcendental level, what this really means is that capitalism functions by allowing its body without organs to move from the inside socius to more outside production in just this way. Because the outside possesses the inside as an alien force, then, we are not just working for capital, we are working as capital, as Ellis says himself. But for just this reason, there is no accelerationism without capitalism. Ellis later moves on to a very important section on the concept of zero, which is necessary to understand accelerationism because of the following strange paradox. If you really think about it, capitalism has limits which aren't really limits, which can itself only make sense if you have some notion of zero. Zero, however, is only really zero if it is not misinterpreted as the naive definition of a mere nothing or an empty void, let alone the Sartrean cliché of lack. Instead, you only really get zero in the proper sense of the term if you arrive at the idea of a transcendental factor of computation, as Ellis calls it himself. It is only with such a computational zero established that the kind of positive feedback loops which define capitalism can be possible. This is because the breakdown from the inside can only be deterritorialized and then drawn back into the body without organs on the outside if you have the sort of temporal mechanism which only zero makes possible. Zero allows such a passage from the inside back to the outside, which once again capital uses to generate more productivity because positing a value which is neither positive nor negative, which is exactly what zero is, is what allows you to open the floodgates for the capitalistic values of profits and losses to make sense because each of those are understood solely in terms of their respective positive and negative locations relative to the placeholder which zero is. In this precise sense, zero is what allows the paradoxes of capitalism to actually be productive rather than self-defeating, as Ellis says himself. Surprisingly, it is not only the capitalist system but also the exit from that system, which relies on such a notion of zero. As Ellis reminds us that the deluso guatarian schizo's line of flight also occurs at zero, because zero provides the condition for a descent into the unknown as such. Because the known, in contrast, is always just a euphemism for that which has been synthesized, we find that in order to get to the new, we need zero, because zero stands at the threshold between the synthesized and the unknown, because each of those two sides are understood in terms of their positions relative to that threshold. Zero is therefore the transcendental condition of capitalist production because it is the condition of a communication between my production on my insight and the production qua desiring production on the outside. At this point, we can finally return to the paradox that capitalism's limits aren't really limits. We now see that what this really means is that capitalism's peculiar relation to its limits is that it only ever continually displaces them in the same positive feedback loop I mentioned earlier, which allows capitalism to not die, but instead to actually gain further productivity from its own contradictions.
This in itself, however, requires us to clarify what sort of strange time is presupposed in this model, which, once again, requires us to revisit the Deleuzian um, interpretation of time qua the three syntheses. Now, if you recall that the big difference between the first and second syntheses for Deleuze was that in the first synthesis of habit, the past, insofar as you have anything like it, is nothing more than a retention of what just happened, which is folded into a anticipation of what's going to happen in the immediate future, which allows the illusion of a passing present to appear on a continual basis. In the second synthesis of memory, in contrast, the past becomes a pure past, which can relate to the virtuality of some abstract quality, like, say, the spiciness of some spicy rye whiskey, which I drank 10 years ago in America. The spicy rye whiskey is no longer present as an actual or identifiable object, but the spiciness as a virtual idea, something I can still aim my memory back to, to have a relation to. This invasion of the virtual we now see simply is another instance of the outside coming into the inside, which we also understand now implies both deterritorialization and re-territorialization plus some idea of a zero. But this takes us then to the third synthesis, for the third synthesis of Deleuze is the one which deals with the future as the pure, unknown newness. While it is customary to think of the future as nothing more than another ordinary present moment which has just not yet happened, Ellis clarifies that this view is dead wrong. The future is not just a smooth continuation of the passing presence which the first synthesis of habit produce. The future instead, in its proper sense of the term, must imply a break or cut in that smooth flow. Or as Ellis says himself, quote unquote, the future is not continuation, it is fragmentation. If the Nietzschean eternal return is just an, a Deleuzean assemblage of times, we find that this is a circle which is inherently decentered, and decentered specifically by the kind of cut which the third synthesis implies. But this is not really a problem, for the Nietzschean eternal return will lead the circle to continue spinning, but from some new reference point, which is unexpectedly exactly analogous to how capital functions. Only now does Ellis finally have a section explicitly titled Accelerationism, in which he explains that, in a very real sense, man becomes an agent of capital, and even becomes capital itself, through a possession by the outside. In this case, the alien force is just the desiring production itself. This possession by the outside is what allows the raw virtualities from the body without organs to be actualized into the socius, as Deleuze and Guattari call it, and for this to happen through man's own inside syntheses. We now see that, put in its briefest form, accelerating the process really just means letting the outside in, because this outside is itself the transcendental. As Ellis says, it is pure time and production in itself. This possession by the outside once again implies the existence, if you will, of zero, which in turn makes capitalism possible through providing the means for things like the retention of a surplus value over time. In terms of Deleuze's interpretation of time, what acceleration really means is specifically breaking off the smooth ongoing continuation of the past, which is exactly what you find in the first synthesis of habit, by instead favoring the third synthesis as the fragmentary cut of the virtual and the new as invading from the outside. Ellis closes the essay by dismissing both leftism and primitivism as being incapable of really challenging capitalism, despite their passionate claims to the contrary. Ellis explains leftism's impotence, on the one hand, through recalling once again that capitalism so easily assumes ideologies challenging it um, 
back into itself once again through preventing any one of those synthesized contents on the inside from ever reaching a state of completion. Instead, capital re-exteriorizes them back onto the outside in order to generate still more productivity from them yet again. In contrast, the way that capitalism deals with anarcho-primitivism, according to Ellis, is to simply leave it out on the outside, to leave it on the exterior to rot away in total irrelevance. Only accelerationism, then, is both inside and outside the system in just the right way to be able to overcome it. Specifically, Ellis dismisses left accelerationist writings as a whole for making the error of confusing acceleration with the naive idea of speed. There is a promise within such literature that speeding up the process of, say, technological automation will liberate the workers in the future by quite literally providing everybody with robotic slaves to do their work for them. This promise of a Marxist utopia arriving through technological automation, however, makes the error of confusing capitalism with the transcendent structurations which are parasitic upon it, such as, quote-unquote, traditional classical profit dynamics, material growth rates, resource extraction rates, etc., to cite Ellis's own examples. In a manner reminiscent of Kant's dismissal of the transcendental illusion which causes the antinomies of metaphysics to seem to appear to the rational subject who is wasting time investigating them when, in reality, there is nothing there at all, Ellis warns that these two would all be but more masks hiding no faces. This contrast between capitalism as the transcendental body without organs on the outside versus capitalism's secondarily transcendent structurations on the inside allows us to clarify that what is being accelerated in accelerationism is precisely not the latter, that is to say, those things which have been actualized into the socius. For those are exactly the things that will be exploded in the acceleration of the underlying virtual intensities of the situation. What is really to be accelerated beyond the chimeras of Marxist ideology which left accelerationists remain enslaved to is just, quote-unquote, to allow capitalism to enact its inherent capabilities regarding perpetual acquisition of the new. Ellis clarifies that acceleration does not mean going faster. It means getting closer to the new. The motor for that kind of acceleration, then, is just the eternal return, because what eternally returns for Deleuze is just pure difference in itself. Because of this emphasis on a future that is really new, because it deals with the difference in itself of the purely virtual, any idea of steering the process into some predetermined direction like, say, the um, UBI utopia made possible by universal automation, presupposes that somebody had the privilege to choose, in a consumeristic sense, what that outcome would be. This, however, is just another empty, transcendent structuration of the inside, which Ellis himself calls, quote-unquote, a dead, strange, terrifying abstraction. Only at this point do we finally understand why the media was wrong to speak of any such thing as an acceleration as politics. Such a term would be founded on a categorical transcendental error because such an acceleration as politics would confuse the transcendental virtual outside with some actualized transcendent structuration on the inside, particularly through the consumerist delusion of thinking that the movement could be steered into some predetermined version of the singularity, such as the Ray Kurzweilian interpretation, which just happens to appeal to the consumption habits of the particular marketing niche which that person belongs to. So this was a lot of fun. I thank you for watching, and I look forward to more analyses. Once again, go out and get a copy of this book.